Bob, then of course we had the, the war started and we immediately, we went, almost went from, I think we had three or four planes in our, no about six max. And uh, there was a couple of other PBY squadrons there too. 23, I think your friend that you mentioned. Uh, uh, Chuck Kohler. I think he might have been on 23. That was 25. In fact, for a while, I think we were called 23, but it was it was kind of a point of confusion. Well, the one thing I remember from uh, Chuck uh, telling me about the time there was, uh, describe your uniform, or maybe you were dressed differently, but he was talking about tennis shoes and shorts, or what were you dressed as then? Well, we were pretty relaxed uh, in those days, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, we put on whites to go, uh, go ashore. Uh, they'd like to see us dressed up a little bit. and. Uh, but whites was usually the, that time of the year would be whites, and um, but sure, well the guys were launching the airplanes. They'd go in the water all the time, back and forth, back and forth. So they allowed us to dress pretty casually. Yeah. Well, before we get back to uh, December seventh, uh, why don't you go ahead and describe the setting there at Fort Island? Uh, how were, what was your barracks? How was the food? Uh, and then we'll get back to yeah. uh, you know the war. Right? Fort Island was a was, as you've seen from the maps, it was pretty much right in the middle of Pearl Harbor. And we did have a, one runway on there and, and, a, and one tower, such as it was. It wasn't considered an operating base, but it was, occasionally planes would come in there and land and take off. And um, the food, we, we lived in a, a barracks, they'd, right there near the, uh, the landing where we went ashore, there was a, and a dispensary. There was a new dispensary, and a uh, combined with that was a barracks, and all the big tilt-up concrete walls and everything like that. All of these, I think, probably were poured walls, but it was that type of construction, and uh, it kind of looked wonderful to me, this kid off the farm, you know, to see something like that, and to have a bunk instead of a hammock, and, and things of that nature. I think I had a very simple. Uh, steel locker with the door on like much like high school kids had those days, you know, for a lot, for the sports events. And uh, so that uh, living was was good, you know. I, I was moving up in the world, I think. Well, my status was definitely moving up. And yeah, real quickly, uh, what was your rank then? Because uh, you'd already been in the Navy for yeah. a while. Well, I, I went from, uh, during that period of time, I'd gone from apprentice seaman which is like a buck private in the Army, you know, and um, $21 a month. And then I think uh, I took a couple of tests to go to a, a seaman, first, uh, seaman, seaman first class, and but it's still below uh, the rank of a petty officer. And then I took uh, competitive examinations and ordnance, and I was by the time the war came along, I was first class. You can see in my picture right up there, I think that was taken uh, well, about the year before, and that must have been taken by some photographer there, some well-known photographer there in Honolulu. You can see I got three hash marks, I mean three uh, chevrons, and I probably didn't have one hash. I guess I just re-enlisted uh, for, for, I extended my cruise, I guess my, yeah, I joined in 37, now this is 41, so four years had elapsed, and it was time to, for me to extend. I could have, have just, so that's uh, what happened in that case. We actually have the date of that in your records, but they keep going, Merle, this is really interesting, so, uh, sure. Well, yeah, that's the trouble, so I, uh, my, 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 have, but anyway, um, and, uh, Proceeding with the war, within a couple of weeks we had new airplanes, believe it or not. I, I, that's when I began to kind of realize what a powerhouse the United, the United States was that could crank out airplanes like that and have them ready. Well, they probably had these on the shelf almost, ready and already made uh, there in, uh, in San Diego. Then that factory is still there along, right along the highway. And these are PBY 3s? P P yeah, PBY 2s. 2s, yeah, thank they, you. they were the basic one with no no wheels or anything like that. That was the flying hull. And that's what we had. And uh, so we had uh, new airplanes, and by, by January the 1st, things began to happen. We, we 
Dion took off in, in the squadron. They, they sent two or three planes down to uh, uh, to Canton Island. Canton Island was about a thousand miles south of Honolulu, and that's where a Pan Am, a Pan Am, that was their island, and that's where their flying boats used to land when they go from San Francisco to Australia. It's, they spend the night there and refuel and stuff like that. Go to the bathroom. <laughs> they had a small hotel there. But we took that over and then for a few days we were flying between there and well, to the west and then coming back into Fiji. Suva, Fiji, which was just south of that. And um, we did that for a few days. Very interesting stuff. And uh, then uh, Shortly thereafter, why, within weeks, we were back up and uh, now, now during this time, we, the squadron had moved from, from, from the Pearl Harbor, from the Foy Island location, over across the island to Kaneohe. And so we were headquartered there at that point. But then there again, we took off real soon and went down to, uh, well, wait a minute, the Midway came in there. And that was like that was like at the end of May, we went out to out to Midway, and it was uh, and that was just a matter of a few days. By the way, I think we were out there patrolling uh, out to the west and, and uh, looking for the for the Japanese fleet, which I guess that uh, Admiral Nimitz and some of those guys they wanted to know exactly where they were and how many ships they had and how fast they were traveling and stuff like that. So we'd go out and eyeball things like that. My, I didn't personally see him, but one of my contemporaries had another airplane, another another VP. Uh, they did. They actually saw them and reported it. Yeah. It's very dramatic the way they play that up in the Midway movie. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, very, very dramatic, isn't it? <laughs> it really is a great moment. Uh, one of the great moments in the movie. Uh, so, are you out there on your own, or, or do you you don't have a carrier with you? Like, are you, no, you're just out there. Yeah, we're just out there. We were just operating. Boats. Yeah, wow. in this case, we were <laughs> operating. We we didn't have a. Uh, that's right. We didn't have a tender to take care of us, so we just used the facilities. Uh, I, I think we just go ahead and, and when we come in and land and refuel. They had enough facilities to us to refuel, and then uh, here again they had. Uh, they had a, a small detachment there, so it was food available. Uh, in the in the uh, in the comet, uh, what do you call it? What, what it was a basic uh, situation. But none of us starved, that's for sure. And uh, in in those days, there was somebody was bringing food out to us all the time, fresh food, stuff like that. We take that aboard the airplane. There was always some guy that was real clever. To, Cooking things up, yeah. Uh, how about beer? I don't. I don't remember much about beer. I'm sure I was around. <laughs> uh, I know that when. Uh, I guess my. my, my I don't, I'm not sure I'd been exposed to beer myself personally. Well, yeah. we do want to hear all the different islands that you hop to. So uh, keep going. This yeah. Is great. Okay. Thank but you. anyway, the pro everybody knows about Midway Island. And, and by about the 3rd or 4th of June, the battle was over with, and we had hot-footed right back to to, to Kaneohe. And then within days, uh, when did I say, that was June, okay, probably the 1st of July, we were on our way south. And we went down to uh, New Caledonia, and uh, then we started moving on up, uh, toward, uh, going north uh, to, to a group of us called, uh, uh, Esperito Santos, I think it was in the New Hebrides Islands, and that was our base, more or less our base. We operated from a ship. We had a tender there by the name of the, uh, I can't even remember the name of that little ship, but anyway, it was built as a seaplane tender. So we had nice bunks on there and nice food, and uh, and they could, uh, you know, we could refuel the airplane. We could even lift it up and, and do a little engine work if necessary. And uh, so that's how we operated, and we did that as a daily event. Flying normally, we would fly a 12, 12 hours flight. You know, six hours out, six hours back was not uncommon at all. And uh, that went on 
for a f several months. I'm trying to think now when it was over with. I think it was in uh, in the following year in in '43. Then it was over with for us. We were sent back, and other people were and moved in to f fill in our ranks behind us. And meanwhile, we lost a couple of crews. So they sent me at that point. The Navy was good enough to send me back to Alameda. And the, by this time, I'd been promoted to chief. I didn't even know it, but I'm, <laughs> I'd, been, oh, I'd been selected also to become a, a warrant officer, a war, what they call a warrant runner. And uh, several months after I was at, Pearl Har at uh, Alameda, somebody said, hey, I think I saw your name on a list over there. So I went over there and they had come back from the Brittany. Bureau of Naval Personnel that had ensign. I was the ensign. Now, let's see, how old was I at that point? <laughs> well, anyway, I, uh, they probably figured I wasn't old enough in years to become a warrant officer. As a warrant officer had always been recognized throughout the Navy and the Army as a senior, older duffers, you know, that had a lot of experience. But uh, so they figured, but anyways, uh, in their wisdom, they made me a an ensign, and uh, so that's uh, and there I uh, I was working with the um, with the headquarters squadron there at Alameda, and we had we had PBYs, and now our newer versions of PBY. We had PBMs, slightly larger version, and they even had some of the big four engine jobs, uh, flying boats, stuff like that, and we would do whatever maintenance was required. And I was on a midnight crew that, that because they operate around the clock. And I think I had the uh, 8 to midnight or midnight to 4 in the morning. I don't know. I kind of like those, you know. And um, usually I'd go ashore then after they're getting off work, you know. And uh, it was during that time when, oh, my friend, he was a chief ordinance man too, Bill Gross out in Honolulu. He, had, he said, uh, he, he knew, when he knew I was going back to San Francisco, hey, I want you to stop and see my sister. And her name was Do was Doris Duke. Is that right? So I went and I called on her, and uh, it wasn't the Doris Duke that you, you, most of it, but she was uh, she had been married to a guy by the name of Duke. And I think it was over with by that time. So I called on her, but that's why I laid my eyes on Helen. That's the beginning of the end for me, boy. When two months later, we got married. Now, I met her at Thanksgiving time. And uh, in uh, the end of January, we got married. How did, um, and, excuse me, how did you meet her? Just through Doris Duke. Oh, it was a friend of hers. Huh? Yeah, oh, there, there were the roommates. Yeah, oh, there was another, another good pal. Oh, oh and, and Dorothy Block. You know, there's pictures of her on Dottie Block. It was Dottie and Doris Duke and Helen, Helen Borman. And uh, so that's when I connected with Helen Borman and for the, for the next 67 years. <laughs> and we were there for 64 and a half years before she died a few years ago.